This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so welcome to class. So uh, as the uh, guideline of recurrent miscarriage has been updated, so um, just I need to highlight those. Apart from this, ASHRAE guideline is also updated last year. So I'll be in this class, I'll be covering a, a clay green top guideline and also this ASHRAE guideline. Okay, uh, th these are very important topics for part two and EPCOG part one also because a uh, lot more number of uh, uh, SBAs can come from here. And um, also for VIVA stations in for MRCOG part three and also for the EPCOG OSCE stations. This is very important topic, okay? And uh, so now let's start. So uh, like according to this guideline, do we already know this? That miscarriage is defined as a loss of spontaneous loss of pregnancy before fetus reaches um, age of viability. It includes all pregnancy losses until 24 weeks. Okay, so this part you have to understand. We already know if it is less than uh, 12 weeks, then it is uh, early miscarriage, and 12 to 24 weeks it is late miscarriage. Okay, now the miscarriage they have divided into two parts. One uh, like one will be the sporadic. Another is recurrent. Now, sporadic, the most commonly it happens in first trimester. And uh, why it happens, the most common reason is the fetal chromosomal anomalies. So you can get question from here. Apart from this, it uh, miscarriage is related with the woman's age. And it can affect 10 to 50% of women age, aging uh, from 50 to 45 years. Okay. So... Um, part two people you may get question from this you know numbers because this was not there in the previous guideline so uh, need to know that now recurrent miscarriage definition you know it is so different different guidelines different um, definitions now let's start with the rcog what rcog says that three or more first trimester miscarriages keeping um, in keeping in uh, like along with the previous RCOG guideline but now what is the change now they say clinically if the clinician thinks they can recommend um, like investigations after two first trimester miscarriages okay so investigation can be started and if there is a suspicion that it is not a sporadic miscarriage it is a pathological then after two miscarriage investigation can be started so the change here in RCOG guideline that previously they used to start investigating after three miscarriages only, first trimester miscarriages. But now, according to the new guideline, definition remains the same, but investigation can be started after two first trimester miscarriages. Okay. So this is the change from the previous guideline. Now, ASHRAE for EPOC people, ASHRAE is important. So ASHRAE. Uh, uh, like terminology is early is is um, uh, recurrent pregnancy losses so definition of ash is very simple two or more pregnancy losses is a, um, a recurrent uh, pregnancy loss now asrm what the asrm definition two uh, first trimester clinical pregnancy losses that has but the document they are documented by scan or by histopathology so these are the definitions and people get confused what to use so I have put all three together. So now the things become easy for you guys. So if you are giving MRCOG, uh, um, then use our knowledge from RCOG guideline. If you are giving EPCOG exam, then you have to use ASHRAE. Now, what is the greatest determinant of uh, miscarriage, recurrent miscarriage? So anyone can you know, answer maternal age, paternal age. Uh, miscarriage, uh, ethnicity, and previous life births. So, what is the greatest determinant? Anyone? Yes. Maternal age. Yes, it is. Yes, it is maternal age. So, uh, the, uh, overall, the greatest determinant of incidence of recurrent miscarriage is age. Okay. So, maternal age. Now, uh, like these are the risk factor. Uh, the, uh, the guideline says. So maternal age increase advanced advancing maternal age, advancing paternal age increase risk of miscarriage. Number of previous miscarriages each with each subsequent miscarriage the risk increases. Okay, I'll just speak the number also. 
and there is no association with um, uh, like if there had been previous live birth there is no association so this part is important to know because you got, they can ask question from here now uh, black ethnicity increased risk smoking increased risk of miscarriage excessive alcohol excessive caffeine okay increased risk of miscarriage bmi if it is less than 19 or more than 25 increased risk of miscarriage so they can't say anything about the chemical exposure so overall what the guidelines say these are the risk, risk factor that are associated with the miscarriage so maternal age paternal age the number of miscarriages black ethnicity smoking excess alcohol and excess uh, caffeine and bmi less than 19 and more than 25 you may get question from here also now uh, okay so uh, as you already know from the previous knowledge also that advancing age associated with dec decline in the number of uh, oocyte and al also their quality because of that risk of miscarriages or anopolite is increasing and what is the age related miscarriage is that i have put it here and uh, part two people would be knowing this very clearly that these numbers are very frequently asked in the exam so you have to like it is hard to remember but you really can't help it you have to do that so uh, most commonly uh, like the uh, they give from here this number is very important like 40 to 44 if the advanced mother age is there so risk of miscarriage is 51 percent and 45 and more so it would be 93 percent these percentages have to be remembered because direct question from this comes in your um, uh, uh, part two exam. So 12 to 19 years, we know teenager pregnancy high risk, so 13% risk. Our 20 to 29 is a little better age for pregnancy. So 20 to 24, it is 11. That is the least, okay? This is the least. After that, it increases by 1% till 29, so 12%. 30, 34, it is 15%, 35 and 39, it is 25%. But the usually the question comes from last two numbers, uh, 40, 44, 51% and 45 and more, it is 93%, okay? This number has to be remembered. Even if the part three people can also remember, that is fine because uh, like recently the exam, uh, recurrent miscarriage station come, came and it it may appear again also in any of the form because the guideline is new now again the uh, each miscarriage uh, increases the risk for further miscarriage so this has been added new in this guideline this um, previously it was not there so i don't know how to remember these numbers but uh, like you have to understand that after three miscarriages 28% risk increase uh, of mis and repeat miscarriage after 4 it is nearing 40 and after 5 it is nearing 50 and after 6 it is nearing 60 so this way sort of a you can remember some of these numbers because as the guideline is updated so as we can come from here now uh, what is the uh, what are the uh, like uh, factors that are responsible apart from what we are discussing is antiphospholipid syndrome that is the acquired uh, hemophilia. So what is that? You already know from your pre uh, previous guideline that uh, uh, there is a association between antiphospholipid antibodies. These are lupus anticoagulant, anti-cardiolipid antibodies, and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein antibodies, okay? And there is an increased risk. Now you can see it is a very increased risk for recurrent miscarriage. Why it happens? Because it causes vascular thrombosis. So this is the main pathological problem that there is a formation of thrombus in the vessels. So how the blood flow will happen. So this is the pathology. Now, uh, like uh, for uh, uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, actually there are three criteria are there. One is a clinical criteria and another is a laboratory criteria. So this is the clinical and uh, to confirm uh, like uh, the patient having this antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, at least one clinical criteria and one lab criteria has to be positive. Now, uh, what is the uh, like uh, this uh, um, adverse pregnancy outcomes or the clinical criteria? This uh, uh, like three or more consecutive so miscarriages before ten weeks. Consecutive means that there should not be a live pregnancy in between them. Okay, 
there should be one or more morphologically normal fetal loss after 10 weeks of gestation okay and one or more preterm birth before 34 weeks because of the placental complication placental disease so these are the uh, adverse outcome or you can say the clinical criteria for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome so i'm repeating it again three or more miscarriages before 10 uh, 10 weeks uh, yeah it, it means continuously that means uh, like first second third all three pregnancy when they are consecutively having miscarriage then we call this uh, uh, by the definition is a recurrent miscarriage so there had been a station in the exam uh, where patient has got first miscarriage then uh, cesarean then two miscarriage uh, at third and fourth number so that will not be the uh, you know that will not um, fulfill the criteria for the recurrent miscarriage and uh, like uh, people my voice is coming my voice there yes ma'am yes, yes ma'am ma okay okay uh, those who are not listening please check their internet because i have checked my internet before i started the class okay so it has to be uh, it has to be like uh, in the consecutive miscarriages if any other uh, live pregnancy or ectopic or something is there in between these three then it will not suffice the uh, you know a cri clinical criteria for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome okay i think i have answered your question now out of those now uh, for part 2 it is important which of the following has the strongest association with miscarriage is it lupus anticoagulant it is anticoagulant antibodies or beta glycoprotein antibodies. Any, any, anyone? A. Very good. Yeah. So it is the lupus anticoagulant has got the strongest, uh, strongest association with the miscarriage. Okay. Yes. It is A only lupus anticoagulant. Now, what is the association? So this I was discussing. So lupus anticoagulant has the strongest association with the um, recurrent miscarriage uh, anti-cardiolipin antibody has got a second uh, strongest association they have given the odds ratio also okay g if you say g and m which is more uh, strongly associated so it is igm anticoagulant uh, um, uh, antibody that would be the more uh, that will have a strongest association beta glycoprotein antibodies uh, has association but uh, like it is least because it doesn't match the statistical significance okay so this is again added new in this guideline this was not there previously it is important for part two people now inherited thrombophilia we already know that inherited thrombophilias are factor v laden mutation protein c or deficient and s deficiency anti-thrombin deficiency and prothrombin gene mutation okay so what they say that there had been a weak association with a recurrent miscarriage okay so uh, inherited thrombophilia implicated as a possible cause uh, of miscarriage in the late pregnancy complication and uh, like what could be the mechanism is only thrombosis only the thrombosis of utero placental circulation but the what the evidence they have uh, uh, shown that there is a very weak association okay so these guidelines very clearly says that the weak association because of that you know they are not uh, they are not recommending the investigations and the treatment uh, for, of uh, uh, for this uh, like uh, if the patient is uh, having this uh, inherited thrombophilia they are taking it as a risk factor and the risk calculation has to be done as we uh, from the risk factors that we did in uh, venous thromboembolism guideline or 37a okay so it is a weak association what they say with a recurrent miscarriage okay which of them has the least um, uh, uh, consistent association with miscarriage anyone can answer it is like uh, uh, factor b protein c protein s deficiency antithrombin deficiency prothrombin gene mutation so what do you think which, which of them have the least uh, consistent association with miscarriage anyone any guess? No, it is not prothrombin gene mutation. It is protein C deficiencies. Yes, it is protein C deficiencies. It has got least association with uh, recurrent miscarriage. Now this, 
uh, just going at this for the ones because it has been added in the guideline is important so factor v laden has got uh, uh, association with first and uh, particularly second trimester miscarriage and prothrombi uh, protein s deficiency second uh, trimester miscarriage protein c deficiency has not shown okay protein c deficiency has not uh, not shown any consistent association with recurrent miscarriage apart from this anti thrombin deficiency is most to thrombogenic mutation so if the if you get a question uh, out of inherited thrombophilia which is the most thrombogenic mutation so answer would be anti thrombin 3 though it is it would be responsible for most thrombogenic mutation but uh, it is uh, uh, but it is not uh, it um, associated too much with the miscarriage recurrent miscarriage okay so it is thrombotic uh, 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 mutation strongest but not uh, too much related or uh, um, with the recurrent miscarriage okay so few things from this part you have to understand because you know Uh, you, you you may get question okay now coming to the genetic uh, factors that is responsible for uh, recurrent miscarriage parental uh, uh, chromosomal rearrangements so what is uh, like uh, uh, translocation is present then how uh, what is the number like percentage of translocation so this was there in the guide new guideline it was not there previously so uh, how to remember would be very hard but yes uh, like you you can just remember if you multiply by 2 it uh, like uh, if it is one miscarriage then double it then it is 2 after 2 you can double it so it comes 4 after 3 you can double it then it comes like 6 so this way uh, you know you try to remember the numbers if it comes you'll be able to pick though i know it is very difficult now this also uh, a new guideline says that uh, now they have uh, they also like uh, um, tells us about the what type of chromosomal rearrangements could be there it could be reciprocal translocation it could be chromosomal inversion it it could be ro uh, robertsonian translocation and it could be others so everything remembering is not possible just you can remember the which has got a highest uh, a uh, like uh, miscarriage rate so it will be uh, reciprocal translocation okay this is this is again new in this guideline it was not there before so the uh, there's so just try to you know just remember these numbers and just try to remember that the uh, reciprocal translocation it it is it has got the highest like 54% of the miscarriage rates then uh, 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 genetic factor fetal chromosomal arrangement so chromosomal anomaly yes too much percentages in the new guideline but we can't help it here uh, chromosomal uh, anomalies are the commonest cause for sporadic and recurrent miscarriage you may get this question in the exam okay so uh, it uh, like uh, uh, previously in previous guideline they used to say that for the recurrent sporadic it is chromosomal and for recurrent it is like aps anti phospholipid antibody syndrome in previous guideline there was a percentage also but in uh, uh, like in new guideline there is uh, like uh, percentage is not there and apart from this like uh, what they are saying for both uh, the sporadic and for both uh, recurrent miscarriage now the chromosomal anomaly are the like commonest cause and uh, so fetal chromosomal anomaly uh, like uh, this could be the that this could be the things there that is trisomy chromosomal uh, polyploidy monosomy and structural abnormalities anomaly so these are the causes for uh, like miscarriage and you can get the question so which chromosomal anomaly has got the maximum association so it is trisomy so in 51% uh, 51.9% of the cases if the recurrent miscarriage happens because of the chromosomal problem so it would be trisomy according to uh, you know uh, according to the what this guideline says so here is the ta table chromosomal anomaly of pregnancy it is is co commonest cause of sporadic and recurrent miscarriage okay miscarriage of euploid pregnancy associated with risk of subsequent miscarriage that we uh, know already that with uh, each miscarriage the risk of subsequent miscarriage increases 
Okay, is it clear? Any question till now? Any question? Okay, now coming to the anatomical factor. So, it, they have divided this in a uterine. Uterine could be congenital and acquired and also the cervical factor. So, congenital uh, like uterine anomalies. So, uh, like what they say that uh, the, they have again given the so many percentages. So, incidence of congenital uh, uterine anomaly, it is increasing. So, if like I have highlighted this number. In the uh, recurrent miscarriage, how many uh, uh, congenital uterine anomalies can be there? So it is nearing 13.3%. But if the uh, another question you may get that the patient is uh, is infertile and there is a miscarriage, so how much are the chances of a congenital uterine anomaly? So it will come to nearing 25%. Okay. So try to remember one number at least. So, and out of this uterine anomalies, which is the commonest, so you may get this question in the exam. Commonest variety is the septate variety. Number one is a septate. This will be followed by the bicornuate or unicornuate um, uh, variety, okay? So, those who are doing scan on the regular basis, they can, uh, they, they would just uh, see that the septate is more followed by the bicornuate or unicornuate. Okay, now uh, acquired, what could be the acquired thing? Acquired will be fibroid or a polyp or intrauterine uh, adhesion or the Asherman. But uh, like association with the risk, with the uh, like uh, recurrent miscarriage remains uncertain. So they are not uh, certain about it, okay? And now coming to the cervical factors. So there could be weakness in the cervix when if there had been previous cone biopsy or like um, and the USG, uh, like uh, shows in the USG, the uh, cervical length is less. So this will be cervical insufficiency. In cervical insufficiency, more common cause of second trimester miscarriage. Usually, uh, like it will not be responsible for first trimester. Because you can understand when the pregnancy grows up, there would be the pressure on the cervix. And that time, it, uh, there could be possibility that the miscarriage may happen. Now, endocrine factor. So, there are certain changes here. So, subclinical uh, uh, hypothyroidism, it is associated with recurrent miscarriage. So, uh, this was not there in the previous guideline. So, uh, what is subclinical hypothyroidism? Subclinical hypothyroidism is when the TSH is uh, like, uh, TSH they are finding it is more than uh, 2.5. And, uh, but if they do T3 and T4, it would be fine. Okay. So this will be subclinical um, uh, hypothyroidism. So that shows the increased risk and presence of thyroid antibody use, anti-TPO antibody we do. That is also associated with re recurrent, uh, increased risk of RCM or recurrent miscarriage. Polycystic ovary is also important and it is also associated with the recurrent miscarriage. And what could be the reason? You make a... a, a, a You can so uh, like in in increase what could be the reason in the PCOS patient for miscarriage? It would be insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, and hyperandrogenemia. You may get question from here. Apart from this, uh, for prognostic, what they say elevated free androgen index appears to be the prognostic factor for subsequent miscarriage in the woman with RCM. Okay, uh, lupus, uh, uh, if the prolactin imbalance is there, then uh, what they say it is increased risk, Lu lute LPD or luteal phase defect. It is not, uh, to, uh, if, there is no evidence to support that it causes recurrent miscarriage. So, like uh, subclinical uh, hypothyroidism, uh, associate presence of the thyroid antibodies, autoantibodies, that it anti-TPO, and polycystic ovarian syndrome, an imbalance of the prolactin. So these are associated with the increased risk. LPD, they have got insufficient data. But if the diabetes and thyroid is well controlled, then there is a no risk of recurrent miscarriage. So this is important to know because, the, you know, in the exam, the role player will ask question, is a thyroid responsible? The answer would be that. 
that if the it is under control then it doesn't cause uh, any recurrent miscarriage okay so these are the few things that is you know uh, like uh, more specified in the new guideline about endocrine factors now the uh, previously also they say the same thing immune factors such as hla cytokinins and uh, like nk cells uh, natural uh, killer nk cells and the uterine nk cells there is no data is there or uh, uh, that supports that this could be the part of that could be associated with recurrent miscarriage so the data is not there now infective factors they are not recommending any infectious screening in the guideline previously also it was the same because the, the, it has got like uh, insufficient or inconclusive uh, um, evidence to support that so usually the factors could be such as uh, like uh, the, those causing bacterial vaginosis and chlamydia apart from this the torch also uh, it doesn't fulfill the criteria uh, so routine torch screening should not be done there, there is a lack of data to support this also so many of the students uh, you know uh, they, they do they do this mistake and they speak about the uh, like bacterial vaginosis investigation and the torch investigation but the guideline um, it doesn't support it, but the guideline doesn't support the infective factor. So please don't do, uh, um, do the mistake and just say the torch test. Though in other, you know, many parts of the, uh, uh, the uh, of the world, um, the doing torch test is very common in the recurrent miscarriage. But the RCOG guideline doesn't support it. So please, uh, for the sake of this exam, don't uh, do any test or uh, any infectious testing okay now uh, coming to the male factors so what they say that uh, increased sperm dna fragmentation if there is an increased sperm dna fragmentation it is associated with increased risk of recurrent miscarriage so uh, like uh, what uh, what they say that uh, like data is more consistent if there had been abnormal sperm dna uh, parameters such as dna fragmentation nuclear protein decondensation from aneuploidy so these are this association is there but on the other side to treat them lifestyle modification antioxidant varicocele and sperm selection so they, they have got very limited study to support this okay so according to the guideline in terms of male factor the increase sperm dna fragmentation is associated with recurrent miscarriage but again the guideline says that there is a limited evidence that any of the intervention will uh, take uh, care of this um, fragmentation so whatever the lifestyle or whatever the medication so nothing is there that can treat this okay now okay so one uh, another one question the patient has got third miscarriage she is upset wants to go for investigation and so how many weeks after miscarriage antiphospholipid antibody test is can be recommended so if the patient has a recurrent miscarriage and you have to advise antiphospholipid antibody testing so when you will call the patient any guess no it is six weeks it is six weeks okay so this is this is again new in the guideline it was not there before so antiphospholipid antibody testing should be done uh, like uh, six weeks after six weeks okay so th these are the, uh, this was uh, like according to the guideline that is there for the risk factor of mis recurrent miscarriage now uh, what the guideline uh, suggests about the investigation any of you have got any question in the in the risk uh, risk factors for the recurrent miscarriage any question till now okay let's move to the investigation so there is a, what uh, what is the investigation that has to be arranged when the woman with the recurrent miscarriage is coming so usually as we know that they are saying that the uh, Acquired thrombophilia, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is responsible uh, for the, uh, uh, the recurrent miscarriage. So they do. So clinical criteria we have already seen. Now this is the lab, lab criteria for, for the confirmation of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So usually the test done is lupus anticoagulant and 
एंटी कार्डियोलिपिन एंटीबॉडी आई जी जी और आई जी एम लाइक इन द मीडियम एंड हाई टाइट द टेस्ट इज कंसिडर टू बी पॉजिटिव इफ लाइक मोर देन फोर्टी जी पी एल एंड फॉर आई जी जी एंटी एंटीबॉडीज एंड फोर्टी एम पी एल फॉर आई जी एम एंटीबॉडीज और इफ द ग्राफ इज डन इट इज अब नाइनटी नाइन सेंटाइल beta 2 glycoprotein uh, though the evidence is less there that is associated but uh, if they uh, igg and igm are in a higher titers more than 99th centile so doing this test once will will not confirm the diagnosis we have to repeat this test 12 weeks apart then two times the antiphospholipid antibody test any one of them comes positive then only we can say the patient has got a confirm it is it would be the confirmed diagnosis for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome for lupus anticoagulant detection uh, like uh, uh, they are what they are using they are using russell viper venom time test together with uh, platelet neutralization test that is more sensitive and specific as compared to the aptt okay so this is the uh, you may get question from here how you will detect the lupus anticoagulant so it will be dilute russell viper venom test uh, along with the platelet neutralization procedure okay so if uh, like uh, one clinical criteria and one lab criteria for is positive for the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome then we'll say that the uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is responsible reason for the miscarriage now in terms of second so they the guideline recommend a uh, testing for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome now in terms of inherited thrombophilia so uh, if the patient has got second trimester miscarriage then uh, they should offer all these testing but ideally uh, it is it, it is done under uh, like with the research constant context as the evidence is not there that it will really support uh, the it is the reason for the second trimester miscarriage okay so if you get a, a state your question where the, uh, uh, like they speak about the pregnancy loss in first trimester that time please don't recommend the any testing or anything from for inherited thrombophilia now okay so the patient has got third miscarriage after 18 weeks she is upset she wants to go for investigation so after how many weeks the inherited thrombophilia testing should be done yes again after 6 weeks so the, uh, the so you have to understand that whether we are doing uh, uh, antiphospholipid antibody testing it was 6 weeks after you know uh, her miscarriage even the thrombophilia testing is done 6 weeks after uh, at least 6 weeks after postpartum or if the patient is taking any hormonal medication if in the exam you get a question that patient has to go for thrombophilia testing but she is on the hormonal medication so uh, the, uh, what would be the answer you have to wait for 6 uh, weeks after the hormonal medication then only the thrombophilia testing would be done okay so this is added new in the guideline so you may get question from here now another question the woman has got a miscarriage at 18 weeks for the first time she is upset and she wants to go ahead with the investigation so what uh, so what will be the correct uh, advice for the patient for genetic testing okay so no the answer is uh, answer is d accept the request and arrange uh, genetic uh, testing because it is is it is second trimester okay so uh, like uh, pregnancy what the new guideline says pregnancy tissue of third and subsequent miscarriages that would be first trimester and in any second trimester miscarriage a genetic testing can be done okay so uh, this is the like uh, the like uh, uh, clue here so it is second trimester and second trimester 
any second trimester miscarriage they will uh, send pregnancy tissue for the genetic testing so this is again update from the new guideline so this is uh, that's all they say about the cytogenetic analysis so pregnancy tissue of third or sub subsequent miscarriages and any second trimester miscarriage so any second trimester miscarriage genetic tissue can be sent for cytologic uh, cytogenetic analysis and uh, uh, like uh, parental peripheral blood karyotyping uh, uh, like should only be done when when the pregnancy tissue reports unbalanced structural translocation okay so if uh, like pregnancy tissue uh, uh, cytogenetic analysis shows unbalanced uh, chromosomal abnormality then only uh, parental karyotyping is done and what we are looking in the parental karyotyping we are looking whether they have any balanced translocation because of that we are doing uh, like uh, parental um, uh, karyotyping okay and uh, uh, and if there had been abnormal parental karyotype okay then uh, referral to the clinical geneticist to be done okay so uh, if the cytogenic uh, another situation that uh, cytogenetic analysis is indicated but the pregnancy tissue uh, either it is not available or a pregnancy tissue is lost or something is there then consideration for direct uh, parental karyotyping can be done so this was not there in previous guidelines so these are the certain changes now if the scenario is given like the patient has came um, after like uh, miscarriage and uh, um, it is like fourth miscarriage and uh, you have to consider going cytogenetic analysis and there is no tissue there then directly parental karyotyping can be done if that is your uh, like uh, if the, that is uh, your suspicion so it was not there in the previous guideline it has come new so uh, two updates here so they uh, like um, in any second trimester miscarriage they can do cytogenetic analysis and if that if you want uh, if you are looking for it uh, uh, please uh, all of you mute yourself that would be good okay so uh, um, so this is the update and this is the update in the new guideline very important to know every, every fine detail because um, for two, part two people you will get question and for part three people you know role player can ask any small question and uh, if the knowledge from guideline is deficient then you may make mistake now this is again a new change in the guideline so what they say the patient with the rcm to be offered 3d uh, usg okay so uh, previously they used to say scan lab and a histro but now they clearly say 3d ultrasonography ideally it should be 3d transvaginal scan okay so this is the investigation of choice now so this is update from the previous uh, like uh, guideline now what these are the detection rate um, this i just uh, click please don't remember because it is very difficult to remember so 3D ultrasound can inter, uh, can detect 97.6% of the you know anatomical problems and out of those if we do the comparison between 3D USG and a cis that is a saline infusion ultrasound HSG and 2D USG so out of this 2D USG will be will be detecting the least uh, number of congenital anomalies okay so first is 3D USG and second better detection rate is uh, uh, saline infusion uh, ultrasonography okay but your guideline guideline recommends to go for 3d scan so 3d scan is a first line and endoscopic uh, uh, evaluation or mri can only be done like when you have when the 3d usg is done and unable to reach the diagnosis so this would be sort of a second line only so first line is 3d usg scan that can detect 97 plus 0.6 percent of the uterine problems okay so apart from this so this is for the anatomical factors now for the endocrine factors this is again added new in the guideline so like if the patient has come with a rcm 
then they should be offered th thyroid function test and TPO antibody testing. So this was not there in previous guideline added here. So TFT and TPO testing to be done. Other tests are not routinely indicated unless some clinical pathology is there. So in the history, if the patient is diabetic, then do diabetic testing. If the patient has got any features for hyperprolactinemia, then do that. But it is not routine. Routine is this much only. So um, uh, TFT and TPO testing. Now for immune factor, uh, test should not be done. For infection, test should not be done. For male factor, test should not be routinely done. Okay, it is the same from the previous guideline that for all these issues, the, as the evidence is weak for the correlation, so the testing is also routinely not offered. Any question, any, any one of you have got a question till now? Okay, now what the RC guidelines suggest about the treatment options? So a lifestyle modification. So this is again a new addition in the guideline. So they want ideal BMI. It should be in between 19 to 25. Uh, uh, like um, this should be the BMI number. Smoking cessation and limit alcohol consumption and limit caffeine to less than 200 milligram per day. So this is the update from the new guideline. You guys may get question in the part two exam and part three people have to explain this to the role player. Now what they say about the APS, we already know. So aspirin and heparin. Now heparin can be UFH or LMWH uh, would be given uh, offered to the patient with uh, APS and a 75 milligram aspirin orally. And they're giving example that 75 asp uh, milligram aspirin and 40 uh, milligrams subcut and oxaparin uh, when the uh, from the pregnancy test positive so uh, like people do have you know sometimes they ask okay uh, when the when they has to be started when the fetal heart comes or when the upd positive okay so now you got the answer very clearly the guideline writes that once the pregnancy test is positive and the patient has got confirmed diagnosis then aspirin 75 and the anoxaparin or he, any heparin from 40, uh, uh, 40 milligram uh, from, to be start, like uh, according to the weight uh, calculation is done heparin to be started once the positive pregnancy test positive and how long it has to be continued till 34 weeks of gestation okay till uh, till 34 uh, weeks of gestation now uh, this is number is important so if the treatment is done then the miscarriage rate would be reduced and how much it is 54 percent this percentage has uh, you, uh, both part two and part three people has to remember now ufh uh, can be given uh, a subcut but ufh has got complication bleeding allergy or hypersensitivity reaction thrombocytopenia and uh, osteopenia and the vertebral fractures so because of all these issues ufh is not commonly used we are using LMWH because it is safe. I do have certain potential advantages like less thrombocytopenia or less risk of osteoporosis and the OD doses are there. Okay. But uh, what the guidelines suggest, if uh, that aspirin and heparin, it to be given to the woman of uh, 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 having history of uh, like um, APS, a, a recurrent miscarriage, and the from the uh, and they have got confirmed diagnosis of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Any other patient with recurrent miscarriage, but APS is not positive. In those patients, aspirin and heparin should not be given because this is again a very routine and common practice in some parts of the you know world that uh, when whenever they say the patient with the miscarriage they will start aspirin and heparin without even you know uh, with a negative uh, like uh, without confirming diagnosis and with the negative diagnosis also but the guideline clearly uh, you know is against it now inherited thrombophilia so uh, the, uh, this i told you previously also that there is a lack of evidence to support any kind of treatment if the patient is having a, a like uh, inherited thrombophilia, what they say that if the inherited thrombophilia is there, 
then uh, it has to be taken as a risk factor for VTE and the risk calculation score has to be done from the 37A number guideline and according to the treatment in the pregnancy would be done. So for inherited from this guideline doesn't recommend any treatment. Now for the genetic factors and the couple with the chromosomal rearrangement. So what are the options? Okay, this is important because uh, because you know uh, it can come as a station in the exam. So what will be the uh, options? So either natural conception, they can still go for natural uh, conception, or they can go for PGTSR. And PGTSR is click pre-implanting uh, genetic testing for structural rearrangements. So the, they are, you know, checking the structure before they implant or consideration for gamete donation. So uh, like uh, currently uh, there is very insufficient evidence to support PGT-SR for every woman, uh, for a woman uh, having genetic factors as a reason for recurrent miscarriage. So these are the options that can be given with the, uh, with the okay, you know, the woman if the confirmed genetic factor is there. Okay, so pre uh, now the term has been changed here to PGT-SR. Previously, it was PGD. Uh, PGD is pre gamete diagnosis and it is pre uh, implantation genetic testing for structural arrangements so you have to remember this also please give three option if you find in the role player station that the genetic factor is the reason now uh, coming to the anatomical and uh, factors so what they say like congenital uterine anomalies there is lack of uh, uh, lack of evidence to treat them if the treatment is done it, it, it should be done with the proper audit or the research uh, context only. Acquired uterine anomalies, again, there is lack of evidence. So the guideline doesn't support any uh, surgical treatment for congenital uterine anomalies and acquired uterine anomalies because the lack of evidence to support that is there. Okay, now another question. Um, a patient has got three miscarriages. She came with the six weeks of pregnancy. Previously, she was tested positive for anti-DPO antibodies. Now, you want to do her uh, um, thyroid function test. So, when the test should be done for this woman? So the patient has got history of miscarriage. Patient has got the TPO, anti-DPO antibodies. And she is seeing you at six weeks. So, when you will recommend the thyroid test? Anyone? Anyone? No, it is seven to nine weeks. So uh, what the guideline says, if the patient has a previous miscarriages and anti-DPO was positive, in that situation, thyroid testing to be done in the pregnancy and it has to be done within seven to nine weeks of gestation. Okay, and also uh, like, uh, uh, so uh, th this is from the SIP, SIP 70. So what they say that uh, there, there is a low quality evidence. If the TSH, like uh, moderate uh, the subclinical uh, the hypothyroidism, it will be when the TSH is more than four, okay? So they, they can say, they are saying that the treatment can be considered, but the evidence is low. Insufficient evidence is there. They also say that if the TPO antibody was there, so uh, the test has to be done for uh, TFT test has to be done at, uh, okay, came in exam, I don't know. Okay, fine. So uh, what they say that test to be done uh, at uh, seven to nine weeks of gestation and subsequent regularly thyroid function test to be done till 34 uh, weeks of pregnancy. Okay, so uh, what the guideline says, okay. And if, if the patient is having uh, only antibodies, then the test to be done at seven to nine weeks of gestation and every subsequent trimester because there could be progression. So if the patient is having TPO antibodies, so test to be done at seven, seven to nine weeks and repeated every trimester. But if the patient has got subclinical hypothyroidism, then the test to be done at seven to nine weeks of the gestation 
and regular repeats regular repeats until 34 weeks of gestation so this part you guys should uh, remember because yes the question can come from here is it clear to everyone is it clear okay so another question uh, a patient has got three miscarriages presented with the uh, a &E with the bleeding she is scared that she would miscarry again so what you will do as advice what you will what you will do a c ma'am c yes yes it is c okay so this is again new in the guideline now the patient is a recurrent miscarriage yes the patient has got a recurrent miscarriage and the patient comes to you with a bleeding then 400 micronized vaginal progesterone to be given twice daily twice daily please all of you mute yourself So um, this is also added new in this guideline. It was not there before. And similar kind of station, those people who have given the part three exam in May, a similar kind of station had come. The question, the station come from this, this question only, okay? So the, in the exam also, the patient has got miscarriage history and she was bleeding and it was her third miscarriage. And uh, in the answer, you have to speak about the vaginal progesterone, 400 milligram two times daily uh, till at least 16 weeks of gestation, okay? So this is new addition and the station has come in the part three and also the part two showed the question. So because of that, whenever the new guideline comes, the chances of it coming, the question coming from there, in, uh, MRCOG exams increases a lot. Okay, now this we have, uh, I have discussed already, but let me repeat everything again. That is very important part. So if the patient uh, has, uh, if the patient thyroid status is fine, no, uh, no, no thyroxine supplementation is done. Okay, if the patient is euthyroid, that means a patient is fine only. TFT is fine, but moderate, uh, moderate sub, uh, uh, subclinical hypothyroidism, that means TSH is more than four, then uh, it is not uh, like thyroxine should not be done routinely but a weak association is there it can be uh, it can be considered okay but if the patient has anti dpo antibody uh, uh, then uh, th like uh, thyroid should uh, thyroxine should not be administered but these patient uh, they should have uh, like testing at seven uh, fr uh, from seven uh, uh, fr they should have a patient having like tpo or patient having subclinical uh, hypothyroidism they should have a TSH monitoring uh, from seven to nine weeks of gestation. This is from the guideline and this is the SIP what I told. So I just, this is the picture from SIP and this is all about the guideline. So guideline says this, okay. So regularly TSH from seven to nine weeks of gestation recommended in the cases if the patient has got anti-DPO antibody positive or the patient having subclinical hypothyroidism. Okay, progesterone supplementation, it should be given uh, in the patient of RCM with bleeding in early pregnancy, 400 milligram macronized vaginal progesterone two times uh, till 16 weeks of pregnancy. So this uh, like a lot more number of questions come from here. So understanding this is very important. This is new update in the guideline. It was not there before. Is it clear? Dr. Variata, I have a question, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It may be far from, yeah, I mean, thyroid, hypothyroidism, we should concentrate it on hypothyroidism as a cause of miscarriage. But what about thyroid toxicosis, doctor? Is this lead to miscarriage too or not? Hyperthyroid. See, uh, hyperthyroid, uh, uh, like thyroid toxicosis could be the reason for miscarriage, but it, it will not come in... Uh, under the category of uh, like uh, recurrent miscarriage because thyrotoxicosis if it happened to any patient there would be so much of symptoms that patient will go to the doctor and the treatment is done 
Yeah, so usually yeah. maybe maybe sporadic uh, it can be the reason for a sporadic miscarriage yeah. but not for the recurrent because of that guideline doesn't uh, you know report it here and in mm. in terms of hypothyroid you will see the patient will be hypothyroid for very long time and usually they don't know anything yeah yeah yeah. yeah 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 all of a sudden when we do investigation in the pregnancy or recurrent miscarriage when they are coming when they have period problems they are coming then we write thyroid and they have got hypothyroid okay so yeah doctor, uh, thank this... you for your question the answer i mean because i was confusing really so you mean thyrotoxicosis usually it's a clinical obvious so we'll detect it earlier yes. while hypothyroidism yes. may be subclinical thanks thanks really mm -hmm. great uh, answer and a thyroid toxicosis patient will come and the treatment will be done so yeah. recurrent will not happen maybe sporadic can happen yeah doctor okay thanks yeah thanks i appreciate that okay welcome no immune factor like immunotherapy in form of parental cell immunization third party donor leukocyte trophoblastic membrane intravenous immunoglobulin is not recommended in the patient for recurrent miscarriage okay so there is no immunotherapy according to the uh, uh, um, G, uh, royal college guideline but this will change in ashray okay male factor again there is no treatment no treatment for it endometrial scratch uh, they don't recommend it okay so uh, these are the like uh, uh, in previous guideline these two things were there but endometrial scratch was not there so it is answer is no endometrial scratch is not recommended now uh, the in the uk there is a dedicated recurrent miscarriage clinics so the patient usually referred there and apart from this this percentage would be important so if there had been like unexplained uh, uh, like uh, recurrent miscarriage patient then the successful future pregnancy with only supportive care it will be 75 percent so the uh, like this uh, this num number is changed previous guideline the number was different i think it was 60 percent in previous guideline but you have to remember this so now uh, according to new guideline if uh, in cases of unexplained uh, recurrent miscarriage patient with the supportive care the successful outcome will be 75 percent everyone uh, like part two part three people should remember this number 75 percent now uh, this is also new in the guideline if the patient has got previous miscarriages and now the patient is pregnant and she has come back so uh, like what the new guideline says that uh, like um, a patient uh, uh, ultrasound examination if she is having any symptom and uh, or directly after pregnancy test and every two weeks so if the patient is having any bleeding or any sort of a symptom after a miscarriage they should have a usg and it can be done every two weeks okay so this was not there in previous guideline so uh, anyone any question till here okay the, uh, at the end of your guideline you know some tables are there so uh, important things i have highlighted so uh, like so ultrasound like if the patient has previous miscarriages and now the patient has come with a pregnancy and again bleeding is there so uh, the usg can be done and it has to be done two weekly till when uh, you know it is not given that in the guideline but till when two weekly ultrasound is done i think it will be till the patient symptom settles but the guideline doesn't specify anything okay about that so i didn't write anything now the uh, now if you uh, see out of this then uh, like uh, the greatest or strongest association uh, like relation with the rcm is maternal age now you can see the uh, you know point estimate it is 30.38 number is not important just you should have a visual impression now uh, which of the following is more related to rcm this kind of question may come so smoking alcohol bmi 17 or bmi 26 uh, which of these have got more relation no it is alcohol now you see it here from this guideline so if if we have to compare the or ratio 
or point estimate from air. Now this is BMI uh, 19, 25. This is the, your alcohol and this is your smoking. So out out of those, if I have to consider which ha which has got the more correlation with RCM, so it is alcohol. Okay, it is alcohol. Now, which of following is more related to RCM? Everyone would uh, answer this. We read just now. Yes. Lupus anticoagulant. Yes, lupus anticoagulant. So you can see this is the um, uh, click point estimate related ratio. Which of the following is more related to RCM? Factor 5. Protein S and uh, prothrombin. So under the answer is protein S deficiency is more related. Okay. No, not a factor V. So you can see it from here, OR ratio. So uh, fact protein S deficiency is more correlated with RCM. If we consider all these three. Okay. Just it is just uh, I made a couple of questions, you know, for, uh, that have uh, that you can revise the table of the guideline behind. Otherwise, no one will remember it. Which of the polling more related to RCM? Everyone knows the answer. Mm -hmm. Separate. Yes, yeah, separate uterus. Now this is this is you can see the number from here, number from here. So separate uterus is like more commonly associated. Now, uh, so everyone knows this answer also. So patient has got three miscarriages and uh, she wants to know what will happen in the future pregnancy 75 percent yes so 75 percent she's going to have a healthy pregnancy that's all uh, uh, these are the only updates from the uh, you know uh, this uh, uh, the royal college new guideline of recurrent miscarriage so anyone of you have got any question can ask me otherwise i will give you updates about the ash rate Okay, so ASHRAE guideline uh, is very important guideline. Now, this is important for like uh, for for EBCO. Which to uh, for MRCOG you have to follow Royal College guideline. For EBCO exam you have to follow ASHRAE guideline. Okay, so this is European Board and that is Royal College. So this guideline previously it came in 2017. There had been uh, it is updated in 2022. So I put the topic together. So it, it is like a few changes are there and I'll try to finish it, you know, fast. So now ASHRAE doesn't say RCM. The uh, ASHRAE, uh, the terminology is RPL. Okay, so uh, it, uh, definition is uh, like uh, RPL uh, diagnosis after two or more pregnancy losses. So definition is change. Here two, change, two or more pregnancy losses. Now, uh, what are the risk factor? So risk factor, what the, it is again the woman age. So it is lowest miscarriage in 20 to 35 years. And it increases after 40 that we already know. And st uh, stress is associated with RPL, but evidence is not there to support it as a direct, uh, direct cause of pregnancy loss. And uh, now risk factors. So uh, smoking. Um, uh, smoking is one of the important factor, maternal obesity and underweight. Okay, the same the RCOG guidelines also says. So normal BMI range is recommended. Okay, apart from this, uh, uh, it is similar the, the RCOG says. So they should be smoking cessation, normal BMI maintenance, and limit alcohol. Um, so uh, why they say if they are taking excessive alcohol? then there could be possibility of fetal alcohol syndrome and couples with RPL should advise to limit alcohol. So limit alcohol, smoking cessation, limiting alcohol and normal BMI maintenance recommended by ASHRAE. Now the risk factors, uh, what they say, the medical history, family history, uh, woman age and previous pregnancy loss history, live birth and the sequence, their sequence is the important that has to be to be taken very uh, in all patients. Now coming to the RPL genetic, uh, in, uh, what they say that genetic analysis is not done routinely. Okay, and uh, if genetic analysis has to be done, then they are recommending uh, array CGH on the base, uh, 
basis of reduce uh, maternal contamination so you, from this line the apoc people may get question okay and parental karyotyping should only be carried out after assessment of the uh, risk for the diagnostic purposes okay so it is also not routine to all patients now uh, uh, like hereditary thrombophilia uh, they are also not recommending as uh, in, as the uh, gtg also says the same for the research purposes it could be done now a aps screening uh, anti phospholipid screening it, it has to be done after two pregnancy losses so this is a this is a little difference from uh, royal college in royal college definition is three miscarriages apart from this uh, they recommend uh, investigation after three but in some of the cases if the clinicians think they can do the investigations after two but in ashre they say that the investigations can be done after two pregnancy losses okay this is for the anti phospholipid antibody syndrome so it it is a little change in ashre apart from this investigation not recommended hla determination anti hy antibody cytokinin testing anti nuclear antibody testing peripheral body uh, nk cells and endometrial tissue so these uh, none of these test is recommended for rpl even by the ashre now endocrine factor so they want uh, tsh and tpo uh, screening so same done by the rcog guideline uh, if the tsh is uh, abnormal tsh is there now if if you uh, for the thyroid screening they are doing tsh and tpo if T tsh they find abnormal then next test will be t4 okay then they will do t4 on the basis of that then the treatment would be started test not recommended ovarian reserve test for lpd androgen testing lh testing and uh, and the uh, like homo cysteine level so no test is recommended only they want these test only so thyroid screening is a recommended endocrine factor test uh, uh, as compared uh, as in the ashray guideline now coming to investigation for uterine anomaly the preferred is the transvaginal 3d usg same it is recommended by royal college guideline also apart from this uh, so uh, if you remember i gave you the table so first was 3d usg second was ultra sono hysterography and below that was hsg and uh, below that was clag uh, 2d usg so same they say so preferred choice will be transvaginal 3d usg sono hysterography is more uh, uh, more accurate than hsg and clag uh, it can only be done if the patient want uh, for the patient if the tubal testing is also required okay and if the patient this this i think it has came in the exam uh, mrcog if the mullerian uterine anomaly like if any anomaly uterine anomaly is there then investigation to be done for kidneys and urinary tract also i think this exam part 2 this, some question from this there has come mri like mri is not considered as a first line it can be um, used even the 3d usg is not available or not there so this question uh, it was not uh, this um, this was not there in the rcog guideline but the question from this line has come in this exam uh, up to my knowledge so male factor uh, like assessment of dna fragmentation can only be considered for diagnostic purposes so they are not recommending any testing for the male also now the prognosis so prognosis in rpl they say depends on the patient age her previous history pregnancy losses live birth and their sequence and they do have certain tool that can predict the estimate of a subsequent live birth and the name of these tools are uh, qualte and westergaard okay so maybe you may get some question but i found it important like a new thing so i put it here okay so they, it is the tool that can give a little uh, you know estimate of the labor in the future pregnancy so for genetic in in terms of treatment for genetic factor it is genetic counseling only 
and for APS now uh, same thing. So uh, this is again difference in the uh, uh, hair in the ASHRAE. ASHRAE recommends investigation after two pregnancy losses, but ASHRAE also recommends treatment after three pregnancy losses. So this is a difference in RCOG and ASHRAE. Um, in ASHRAE investigation and treatment after three miscarriages. In ASHRAE um, the treatment uh, after three and the investigation of RPL can be done after two pregnancy losses. So they uh, again same low dose aspirin or like UFH, LMWH, anything can be done from the date of pregnancy test positive. So this now this part should be very clear because pe people are confused here when to start aspirin and when to start a heparin. So please understand this. So this is important for your all exam questions. Thrombophilia, they, they, they will use it as a risk factor and uh, they will do testing according, like risk assessment and according to that the heparin will be started. And only just for the recurrent miscarriage they will not do treatment in case of thrombophilia. So over this is same again the same in over hypothyroidism like they will do uh, over hypothyroidism has to be treated only so levothyroxine would be given but subclinical hypothyroidism again what they say that the testing uh, like uh, testing has to be done after seven to nine weeks of gestation so this is same as we saw in the uh, new royal college guideline also and uh, if the uh, patient has got uh, um, antibodies and they are pregnant again the same answer the testing will be done seven to nine weeks of gestation and if the thyroidum uh, hypothyroidism is detected that the treatment with the levothyroxine is done so take home message subclinical hypothyroidism or if a patient having thyroid Im autoimmunity if they come to you with the pregnancy please do thyroid testing at uh, seven to nine weeks of gestation and if they found confirmed positive with the uh, hypothyroid uh, investigation it is proven that they have th hypothyroid then this treatment to be done with the levothyroxine okay so this you have to this is very important part now endo uh, they, uh, this is new in the this is there in the ashray only uh, for a patient they offer prophylactic vitamin d in pre-pregnancy period prophylactic vitamin d in pre-pregnancy period and there is insufficient evidence for progesterone, HSG, and metformin. Here they differ from the uh, your RCOG guideline because in RCOG guideline, recently, uh, if the patient present with the bleeding, progesterone is added. So this is the difference here. Okay. Now anatomical factors again, they don't recommend any metroplasty, uterine reconstruction. They're not in favor. They don't support even removing submucosal fibroid endometrial polyps and also because what they say there is an insufficient evidence to recommend uh, removing fibroid that distort the uterine cavity also so they, so they are not suggesting any treatment for uh, uterine problems if uh, in the patient who is having rpl now again anatomical uterine factors there is insufficient evidence for for the removal of fibroid polyp and uh, intrauterine adhesions so no treat, they have got no evidence for this also so for rcm this treatment is not done according to the guideline now for cervical uh, integrity what they say if the if the patient has a history of second trimester uh, pregnancy loss okay patient having history of second uh, trimester pregnancy loss then we already know that the serial uh, sonographic surveillance is done and according to the accordingly if uh, one pregnancy and previous uh, second trimester pregnancy loss then consideration for circlage can be done circlage usually they are doing but if there is no evidence that doing this will increase perinatal survival there is no evidence that it will increase perinatal survival okay apart from this male treatment actually there is no treatment the only lifestyle modification cessation of smoking normal weight limited alcohol and normal exercise pattern they are saying apart from this there is no role for sperm selection 
no role for antioxidant in a male factors when the patient is having uh, like DNA uh, fragmentation reason for the recurrent miscarriage. Now again there is limited uh, uh, evidence for lymphocytes, steroid and heparin and aspirin if the patient is having unexplained uh, recurrent uh, uh, um, uh, pregnancy losses. So, if it, so they don't suggest any kind of treatment. Now this part is different that was okay this part is different that uh, like uh, in the RCOG guideline they're not saying any uh, you know uh, like uh, they're not saying anything uh, about uh, they don't recommend immunoglobulin but this this is new in this guideline that uh, if there has been uh, like uh, um, uh, if the, the patient has got four or more unexplained pregnancy losses then a high dose of um, immunoglobulin in early pregnancy may improve live birth rate so this was newly added in the guideline it was not there in previous one folic acid to be given not for rpl but to decrease prevent the neural tube defects vagina okay this is again update that vaginal progesterone can be given after three or more pregnancy losses and uh, and uh, and vaginal blood loss in subsequent pregnancy so if patient has got uh, uh, rcm uh, the, like three pregnancy losses or more and the vaginal bleeding is also there then vaginal progesterone can be uh, offered uh, um, after three or more rpl again they doesn't specify here as the rcog has said till 16 weeks so they're not specifying that so this part is different in the from the rcog guideline now this is the summary so in summary uh, that uh, according to the um, ashray rp recurrent pregnancy losses when it is more than two or more pregnancy losses now the recommended test is anti phospholipid antibody testing uh, for the, uh, and th for testing for thyroid abnormalities and 3d usg so these are the tests usually you recommend to the patient and if it is uh, if the anti ap is positive aspirin heparin from the day pregnancy test is positive if thyroid abnormalities are there a patient has got uh, confirmed hypothyroid levothyroxine and uh, usg uh, if the 3d usg shows anything there is insufficient treatment there is insufficient treatment now these kind of uh, like uh, this these kind of tests done for the uh, explanatory purposes only but no specific treatment is possible lifestyle uh, advice for the men and for the female what they are saying is a lifestyle advice and prophylactic vitamin d this prophylactic vitamin d it was not there in uh, you know a royal college guideline so that's all about the summary and these are the differences so that's all i had to say so now uh, the, uh, this is the announcement that there would be live circuit course uh, on 15th november for mrcog anyone interested can join and uh, yeah these are the few uh, for previous classes you can get uh, like uh, you can go to the mission mrcog website in library section you will find all classes thanks all for joining any one of you have got any question can ask me any question anyone anyone any question Hello, anyone of you have got any question? Okay. No question, then bye people.